All right, welcome everyone to the August 2020 meeting of the Mississippi PowerShell User Group. Tonight we have Anthony Nocentino with us, and he'll be presenting Containers, You Better Get On Board, PowerShell Edition. Take it away, Anthony. Cool. Well, thanks for having me back. I think it's been about a year or two since I've presented, but I appreciate uh, you reaching out and having me present again. So this is Containers, You Better Get On Board, the PowerShell Edition. Uh, clearly, this is uh, from a PowerShell Summit presentation from last year. Uh, but like I said, we were kind of chatting before the presentation. I get a little extra time with you guys tonight. So um, please feel free to ask questions throughout and kind of elaborate on some topics if you feel like we need to. Uh, I'm Anthony Nocentino. I'm a consultant and trainer. I'm a founder and president of Centino Systems, where I specialize in system architecture and performance. So I like to design systems and I like to make things go fast. Uh, I've been a data platform MVP for the last couple of years. Uh, and that's been kind of the primary space that I've been operating in, but I've been hanging out with the PowerShell crew for a long time and learning a lot about how to manage SQL servers with PowerShell. And then the whole other universe that I operate in is in kind of this, the Linux space. And those two things collided epically in 2017 with SQL Server on Linux. Now we have SQL Server on containers. Uh, normally I do this session with a lot of SQL Server demos, but I've retooled it entirely to show you how we can use PowerShell inside of containers. Um, at the bottom, there's my contact info. Please feel free to email me, hit me up on Twitter, uh, and follow me on Twitter if you aren't already, please. It's kind of my main way to interact with the community. And I blog a whole bunch, not so much recently because I've been completely buried on a project. Hopefully I can come out and start producing some good content for the blog again soon. And I'm also a Pluralsight author where I do a lot of work in the Linux space and also in Kubernetes. Uh, I've been producing a series of courses on the certified Kubernetes administrator, which should wrap up here in the next couple of weeks. So look for that. If you want access to that content for free, please hit me up via email and I'll send you a trial code uh, so that you can get access to that content for free with no strings attached. So let me know if you want that and my info will be repeated again later on at the end of the session. So we have a lot to go through today. Uh, we're gonna talk about what a container is. So the cool thing is, if you've never seen a container before, this is the session for you. And with that then, we're gonna kind of talk about the container universe, like kind of who are the players out there, like what are the things that you need to know because there's lots of emerging tech, lots of things getting thrown around, lots of tools and techniques, and we'll kind of just sniff around a lot of that. We'll talk about running both SQL Server and PowerShell in containers. And I like to do both because predominantly the PowerShell audience gets SQL Server, right? They understand the application, they know what a database is. And so we'll see that in the concepts of starting and stopping a container and also persisting data inside of a container. Now, on the other side of the fence, we'll also do a bunch of demos with PowerShell, and I'll show you how you can run PowerShell scripts inside of containers, arbitrarily pick, you know, maybe I want to use PowerShell Core 6.2, 702, whatever it is I want to use to test out maybe my scripts or deploy some jobs. And we'll talk about the tools and techniques in that space, and we'll do lots and lots of demos. This is about half demos, and you will get access to all of that source code. Uh, so yeah, lots and lots of demos. And then we'll talk about the concepts of container orchestration. Because when you're running containers in production, you don't really, you'll see when we get into it, there's kind of lots of commands and syntax and things you have to be concerned about with starting up containers in an enterprise fashion. You're really gonna to wanna to look at using a container orchestrator. We'll talk about the concepts of container orchestration. And so when I did this presentation at PowerShell Summit, uh, this was probably like a week or two before um, the presentation and I really wanted to do this session with all demos. I don't think it's possible because there's just a little bootstrapping of theory that we have to get to and then it's going to be all demos for a long period of time. And so when we're talking about containers, one thing that one concept that we're used to hearing as IT professionals is virtualization. We're really hip with what machine virtualization is. Well that level of abstraction shifts from the virtual machine into the operating system. And so the operating system is the thing that we're gonna share, right? So I can have a single OS, I can have an application run on top of that OS, and that application is gonna be completely isolated from any other applications running on that OS. And so the things that it's gonna share are the kernel and the system's resources itself. So the kernel is the way that applications access resources, you know, CPU, disk, RAM. 
and also kind of the management of those system resources. And we'll dig into those concepts a little bit later. And so what is a container, right? So the container is really just your application, right? It's the compiled binaries, any libraries that it needs to run, and possibly any file system components, maybe configuration or things like that. Now, when you're working with containers, you generally will have one application inside of a container because these concepts of isolation that we'll talk about in a little bit are extremely valuable. And moreover, it really kind of becomes the unit of work. I'm gonna start up a container. It's gonna do this thing for me, this one thing. Now, there are application scenarios where you might run multiple processes or multiple applications inside of a container uh, if they're really, really tightly coupled. Um, not generally not like multi-tier architectures or client server client and server applications you wouldn't run those in a container but maybe something that's a real tight producer consumer relationship you would now this is where things get crazy for me especially as a data professional because the one thing that i have to do as a data professional is keep things around as long as possible and well if containers are ephemeral which really means i i have the ability to just take this thing and throw it away and then i can start it up again and get my same exact application back. Now, when we start working towards persisting data, we're gonna talk about the concepts of decoupling configuration and state. And so this idea of being able to throw away a container and start a new one up, and I have the configuration and I have the state of my applications external to the applications really is a liberating concept. And we're gonna see that throughout the presentation today. So yeah, oh yeah, there's my, <laughs> that's my app very artistic representation of a container. Our application and its binaries and libraries are running inside of a container. And so let's start off with the comparison. That's kind of the big picture of what a container is. And so in enterprise computing, for a long, long time, we've done this. We bought a physical machine, we installed a hypervisor, and we installed a bunch of virtual machines on top of that, or the guest operating systems. And then on top of that, we installed all of our applications onto those individual OSs. You can take this picture and stamp it out a bunch of times, and that's an enterprise class data center. And I like to say that this is kind of high maintenance, right? I still have to care and feed for all of these operating systems and all of these applications. Like this is my desired state. I need to keep this thing in this state all of the time. And if something goes wrong, I have to put my cape on and fix it, right? And get me back into that desired state. And what I like to think is, well, what did we really gain by doing this? We gained better or more efficient utilization of the hardware. Well, I could challenge you on, well, what's the cheapest thing in your data center? It's probably the hardware, right? You're the most expensive thing in your data center. And so if you still have the same surface area of stuff to manage, well, did we really gain anything? And I can challenge, like the challenge is that, no, we really haven't gained much by using virtual machine with the exception of better utilization of our hardware. So in the container universe, we can have a physical and virtual machine, and we're kind of still reducing the surface area of stuff that we have to manage and that we have a single host operating system that we'd have to manage, and then we can deploy applications on top of that. And then again, we can stamp this model out multiple times inside of a data center. I like to think that this is lower maintenance because now I'm reducing the surface area that I have to manage and my unit of deployment isn't tightly coupled to the OS because I'm able to deploy my applications in a self-contained way that we described earlier with OS virtualization and things like that. And so I like to say that this is a little lower maintenance because now if I need to change out an application, I don't need to necessarily get my hands dirty and log into a server or anything like that. I can just kill this application and redeploy it, right? kill application one, get the new version, application 1.2 and roll that out. And we're gonna see that concept when we get into the demos of kind of kill it and redeploy it and always bring them back or always starting from that container image and bringing our application data in externally. So that's kind of the big picture of containers and virtual machines and why I think virtual machines are kind of the old way and containers are the new way and a little bit of the benefits. And so now let's talk about the container universe and jokingly i like to say this is easily the cutest logo in all of enterprise it that's the docker whale who i believe his name is moby so docker is a technology right uh, docker inc is a company docker inc kind of brought together all the tooling to make containers a very easily consumable thing and then that tooling was donated to the community and open sourced and now you'll see things like cri container runtime interface 
uh, OCI or container initiative, I think. And there's another one that defines like a, the standardization of the container image itself. All of that stuff is standardized open source tech now, which is really, really great because then everyone's kind of doing containers in a similar way using the system resources from the operating system. The things that make up containers, right, those under the hood things are facilities of the OS. Docker and the tech that they brought to the table gave us the management pieces to be able to create and manage containers very, very easily. But Docker is not the only player in the game. There's other players in the game or other container runtimes available to us, Rocket, CoreOS, Windows containers. Before the session, we were talking about uh, running Docker on Windows, some of the pain points around that. You can run Windows containers on Windows operating systems. You can run Linux containers on Windows operating systems. But the concept that I'm talking about today will primarily be Linux containers on either Windows or Linux operating systems. Uh, if you're of a certain age, like me, uh, FreeBSD had a technology called Chamber Jails uh, back in the day, late 90s, early 2000s, which provided process isolation and file system isolation. And those are kind of the two of the key core concepts behind containers. So Chamber Jails, uh, you could arguably say that those are roughly a container kind of engine or forefather or, you know, uh, that's the word I'm looking for, uh, preliminary or pr technology to containers coming out. So that's kind of the container universe. Now, like, what do we, how do we get containers? Like, what do we do to work with a container and things like that? Well, I've been using the term container a little liberally so far. And so let's be a little bit more precise about what a container is and what a container image is. A container image is the actual code or the program code, the binaries, runtimes, libraries, and also environment variables that make up the thing that I'm going to start up, which is the container itself. Registries are where images live. So you might've heard of the term Docker Hub or Azure Container Registry, or you can even have, even have your own internal registry. When I make a container, I'm gonna park that thing in a registry so that we can share it with other people in our uh, within our organization or potentially on the internet with multiple organizations. A Docker file defines what a container image is. What program do I start up? What port do I listen on? What environment variables do I need to set? Do I need a volume mounted? All of that stuff is defined inside of a Docker file. And so let's kind of go through the process of how someone would make a container. So if I want to make a container image, what I'm going to do is write a Docker file. That Docker file is gonna have some code that talks about those things that I just talked about. I'm gonna load this program, I'm gonna listen on this port, things like that. Maybe I need to do some intermediate compilation, whatever it is. I then say I'm gonna use, excuse me, copy my application into the container with any of the binaries and libraries that need to go in there, and then we execute a Docker build. Docker build runs the commands in a Docker file and makes that container image. Now that image is stored locally on my, you know, on your computer in the local container runtime until you do this, until you push it to a registry. And then when you're ready to run the container, you wanna pull that container down onto a host operating system and that container will start up. Now today we're gonna to focus on from the registry down. We're gonna use pre-built pre container images that are supplied for us. We're gonna use some SQL Server images and we're gonna use some uh, PowerShell container images. And so Microsoft did the stuff on the left where they built the image and pushed it into the registry. And we're just gonna pull the containers down and run those applications on our local host operating systems. And so again, coming from the data platform universe, this is like the biggest question. People are like, so I heard these container things are like ephemeral and it could just get deleted them and they just go away forever. That's like really bad if I wanna use databases. And I'm like, yeah, it's really bad if you wanna use databases, or you can do it in a way that decouples that configuration and that state from the container itself. And that's what we're gonna talk about now. And so we really care about data. And so let's kind of go through the concepts of how we manage data persistency in containers. And so on the right here is again, that very detailed enterprise architecture of running multiple applications as containers on a single host operating system. Well, the container image itself, when we start up a container is read-only, right? That thing that we're sharing is 
a read-only image. We pull it down, we start up our application. As data changes, it's gonna be written into what's called a layer. And so it uses a copy on write technique. And so those two things together make the running container, the read-only copy, and then the stuff that's changed. Now, if your container is alive, like if you don't delete your container, well, that stuff is all in one place. It's in the container image and also in that writable layer where those changes have been written to. Don't delete the container. Or you can do this. You can decouple that writable layer from the container, the running container itself, which is called a Docker data volume. And what you wind up getting is something that looks like this where we have a volume that's mounted into the container at a particular file system location. I tell my apps to write to that volume location, and now it's actually writing to a location external to the container itself, potentially on the base OS, or even on a, maybe some sort of storage array or network shared storage. What that means now is all the writes for my application go into that volume. I can take that application container and throw it away, put a new one on top of it, and my data is still there. That potentially could be a patch, a major version upgrade, anything like that when we're talking about servicing our applications. It's a very liberating technique to upgrade apps. Now, in the PowerShell universe, what's the vision for PowerShell Core, right? This is still true, right? We want to be able to run PowerShell everywhere. I want to run it on Linux. I want to run it on Mac. I want to run it in containers. I want to run it on ARM devices. I want to run it wherever I can possibly run PowerShell, right? In this cross-platform universe, that Microsoft has been working towards over the last couple of years. What if I wanted to run whatever version of PowerShell that I wanted to accomplish a task, right? Traditionally, in Windows PowerShell, you had a version of PowerShell for that operating system, and it was very, very tightly coupled. PowerShell Core ate away at that problem a little bit, where you can potentially have multiple versions of PowerShell running on a single OS, but you still kind of had some things you had to worry about with environment variables and making sure I was pointing at the right binaries and things like that. And containers really attack that problem. We're gonna see, I can arbitrarily select any version of PowerShell Core that I wanna run and inject a script that just, it runs on that version. And that's a great way to test out new code on new versions of PowerShell without having to do the full installation. Now, again, I kind of touched on this a second ago. I can run PowerShell as a container, wherever I want. You can run containers on ARM devices, Linux, Mac, wherever, in the cloud. Uh, recently, this is actually quite a cool development. Uh, if you've used, I, I wish I could say everybody raised their hands. Everybody raised their hands if you use Cloud Shell. But Cloud Shell can, is, or Cloud Shell inside of the Azure portal is implemented as a container, and that container is now available for you to download, which I think is fantastic, because all of that tooling is available for you to have wherever you want as a container. What if we wanted to run a script in a container and then that container goes away when we're finished, right? Sounds like serverless, right? I can arbitrarily start up a container, run a job and delete the container, which is fantastic for auditing. Uh, job distribution. Now, what if I needed to run multiple jobs inside of containers, inside of an enterprise data center? Well, that's where we're gonna talk about container orchestration in a little bit. Let's kind of see how that pieces together. Testing, I kind of alluded to, varying versions of PowerShell, being able to test our scripts, maybe out in the wild, in our different environments that we have to support. And then of course, development scenarios. You could build self-contained um, containers for developing new PowerShell modules and things like that. Maybe you need a particular version of X and Y, and you can kind of have it all tucked inside of a container and isolate it, and then you can work those issues out without having to muck up the base operating system or other parts of an OS that potentially could cause development to be challenging, kind of having a core slice of that particular environment running inside of a container. Because I'm sure we've done this before with virtual machines. Well, this VM's got this module, which conflicts with that module, so I have to have this other VM over here, do that kind of development, and containers can directly attack that problem. Now in the SQL Server universe, like why would I do this for SQL Server? Like why would I run SQL Server on containers? Same reasons, right? It's gonna make development, upgrades, patching, all of this stuff a lot easier. And it gives me the ability to do things quickly. Um, when I talk about deploying SQL Server, this is like a great audience to make, poke fun at this. Um, I was on the DSC bandwagon for like two or three years and I got to the point where I was pretty good at it and I was deploying SQL Server at customer sites with DSC because it gave me a quick automated way to deploy a SQL Server. Um, 
because when you deploy SQL, it's not just installing SQL Server. I have to have accounts in the right place. I have to have um, certain things done inside of Windows. So I was using different modules and things like that to bring that all together. And at the best, absolute best, I could roll out SQL Server it was like two or three minutes. You're going to see me roll out a SQL Server in like one line of code and like 10 or 12 seconds, which is crazy to think about. Uh, there are Windows and Linux versions of SQL Server available. Uh, if you want to use Windows-based SQL Server and containers, check out that link there, but it's not supported in production. Uh, the only container that's supported in production when deploying SQL Server is the SQL Server Linux container, which is fine. That's, you know, but if you're running third-party apps, that can be a little bit challenging. Uh, but I will say this, and this is my own personal opinion. If you look at what the SQL Server team is doing with containers, things like Azure Arc Data Services and uh, big data clusters all run on Linux-based containers on Kubernetes, which is a big, big, big deal, I think. All right, so that's, uh, I think it was like 14 minutes of theory. Now we're gonna get into some demo. So that's kind of smooth sailing from here on doing some stuff. So we're gonna talk about pulling images, running containers, accessing applications, connecting into containers to do things, persisting data, in containers and then we're also going to work with powershell where we're going to inject commands and scripts into containers and we're going to build our own serverless environment function as a service i think i don't even know if that's a real acronym faz but whatever let's get into that all right so there's this i need to double check one thing before we get too far do 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 d5 c5 i'm just yeah, I ran all these demos today. Cool. Yeah, I, I had to um, just in prepping, I ran everything today, but also in prepping my laptop crashed, which was fantastic. So let's get cranking. Um, again, if there's any questions, just feel, feel free to hit me up throughout. Are we doing good, Dave? Oh, yeah, I think we're doing good. Yeah. Okay, cool. No questions or anything also, so far, so. Awesome. And, that, and I, I wanted to do that to make sure that I wasn't talking to myself. Hopefully you guys are still there. I watched a presentation about a week or two ago and the poor person that was presenting talked for like eight minutes and they had disconnected. And then someone actually had to call them and be like, hey, you're disconnected. But yeah, no, we're still here and we're still, we're still awake. We're good. Cool, cool. So remember the picture, right? We're going to pull from a registry. That's the first thing that we're going to do. Microsoft did the left-hand side where they did the build and push. Uh, now we're going to do the pull and run. So Docker, when you install Docker, you get a sequence of commands. To, to You get this command, Docker, uh, pull, and then you're going to pull the container image. And so it's going to walk through the syntax here from left to right. So mcr.microsoft.com is a container registry that's maintained by Microsoft. So this is a short for Microsoft Container Registry. Now the SQL Server container lives at this location here in a, what's called a repository. That repository has tags for the images that are stored in it. And so here we see 2019 CU5 Ubuntu 18.04. So that's a kind of a standard, not a standard, that's a, a convention that the SQL Server product team uses to identify individual containers. Version uh, CU or cumulative update. Um, it's kind of like a mini service pack, for lack of a better term, because server packs, service packs aren't a thing anymore. The platform and then the version within that platform. And so when I run this command, what that's gonna do is it's gonna pull down the container images, that container image from the container registry. Because I don't wanna have to make you all wait for me to download a gig and a half from the internet, I pulled it ahead of time. And so that's what it's telling me right here is that my image is up to date for that particular tag. Now on my laptop here, I have a whole collection of container images that we're gonna be using today. And so if I do Docker images, that's gonna give me a listing of that. So on the left here, we can see the repository, you can see the tag, a unique image ID, when the image itself was created, and then how big the image is. And so we have a couple in here. And so here's the one that we were working with a second ago, which is 2019 uh, CU5 Ubuntu 1804, and it's image, this one is 1604. And so you can see that it's just how they are able to slice and dice the different uh, versions of SQL Server and the different containers that are available. We also see some PowerShell stuff in here. So they're from the PowerShell container registry. We have latest, which I believe is, I checked earlier, 
is 703 for PowerShell Core. Um, we have Preview, which is, I checked earlier, 7.1 Preview 5. And I also have a specific version that I pulled down of 7.0 Ubuntu 18.04. So they're using the same convention, version of the app, platform, version of the platform, because there's multiple versions of Ubuntu. There's, hey. oh yeah, I was going to say. Well, can I interrupt up? for a second? Yeah, uh, yeah. Just had a request if you could make the font a bit bigger. Sure. VS, if you don't, if you don't use VS Code, that might be the like the best feature in the planet right there. Is on on a Mac, it's Command Shift Plus, and it zooms you in like that. Is that better? Yes. Cool. Uh, since you paused, um, a quick question: When you do a Docker mm -hmm. pull, where does it pull that image down to? So that is going to depend on your OS, and so for me, that's going to go into. Do, 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 do. Where is that? There. It's kind of fate. It's kind of the text isn't very bright. Uh, but for me, it's USR, AEN, library, containers, and then this path, com.docker.com slash data slash something. Um, and so I'm assuming on Windows, it would have a similar uh, location, probably in program data or in your user profile, I would imagine. Uh, but that is configurable. Uh, let's see. So, yeah, so I pulled down a container image. Um, now, there is a fancy-dancy way to use filtering and all this command line syntax inside of Docker to filter, um, do text filtering on what things I want. But I've just, I use grep. Uh, grep is aliased on Windows PowerShell, so this technique would work on there as well to basically get you select string to read or to filter the text for you to get a shorter list. And so that's the technique that I use, and then we can do that for PowerShell as well. Cool. This uh, other image here, or excuse me, same image, we're going to look a little bit closer at this CU5 image. So my favorite command inside of Docker is this, inspect. So I can say Docker image inspect, or Docker container inspect, or Docker volume inspect, and get the deep dive gory details about that object. In this case, I'm going to inspect an image and I'm going to pipe that in the less so it doesn't run off the screen. And inside of here, it kind of tells me like what's really happening inside this particular container image. And so this one is 2019 CU5 Ubuntu 18.04, just like we talked about, but it's also got another tag of 2019 latest. And so you'll see that convention a lot inside of containers. Well, this is the latest image. Uh, and what that will do is the repository maintainer will point that latest tag to the newest version of their application, which is great if you're messing around. But if you do it as for real inside of production systems and you re you reinstantiate a container or recreate a container, well, the last thing you want to do is pull latest because that's going to potentially upgrade your application, right? Fantastic for fun, not so great for running it for real. So keep that in mind uh, when you spent when you use this in production. Going down a little bit further, we have some other Things you can see inside the container are exposed ports. That's what the application is listening on inside of the container. We have some environment variables set. And we also have the command that is used or started when this particular container starts. And so in this case here, it's going to start uh, SQL Server. So it's going to break out of there and run our first container. And so I'm going to bring this down on a new line because typing in demos is a really good idea. Um, so I'm going to start our first container, Docker run. Uh, SQL Server requires I inject two environment variables to start my application. This is one of the reasons why I like to talk about SQL Server first, because this is really a core concept. This is how we inject configuration into a container, right? So Microsoft's like, hey, here's a SQL Server container. And they don't set the ASI password for you because that's what you have to do. And so that means... I have to tell it when the container starts what the SA password is. And so when this application starts up, it reads these two environment variables. Hey, what's the environment variable for except EULA and MSSQL SA underscore password? And then it, it takes those values, persists them inside of the application configuration, and we go about our business. That's a very powerful concept of being able to inject configuration into our applications. Uh, we're gonna give our container a name. In this case, it's gonna be SQL 1. And we're going to listen to, uh, listen on a particular port. So on the left here, 
is the port that my application is going to listen on when it's running on my laptop, right? Like literally on this machine, uh, on whatever IP address my wireless network card is on. It's same thing inside an enterprise data center. That's where you would point applications. Inside the container, SQL Server is going to listen on that port. I could have 100 SQL Server containers up and running. This one is always going to be 1433. This is the one that I have to kind of do the dance around and make sure everyone has a unique port. I'm going to detach the container. And this is very critical when we talk about uh, things that run as services versus things that have to run interactively. This runs as a service, so we're going to detach the container so it runs in the background when I start up the container. When we get into the PowerShell demos, you'll see me run a um, interactive terminal. We'll see how that works. So there we go. We can see our container started up because we've got the container ID here. And if I do a Docker PS now, I can see my container is up and running. So there's the container ID. And you can see it's this part of the container ID that was point, uh, returned to me on standard out. There's the container image that I ran, the command that was started up. It was created seven seconds ago. It's been up for six seconds. I'm going to zoom out for a nanosecond, but then I'm going to zoom right back in because of the word wrap there. My application is listening on all IPs, so 0.0.0.0, .0, .0, .0 colon 1433. So that's where I would point users to to access this SQL server. Uh, and it's going to forward it into the container on 1433. That's when we looked inside that uh, Docker image inspect. We saw exposed ports. That's what we're listening on there. So now I'm going to access that application. So if I just want to come along and use SQL CMD, which is a way for me to interact with SQL Server at the command line. So just think of this as any other client server application. I'm going to point it to localhost on port 1433. And I'm going to run a query, a very simple query that's like, hey, what's your name, SQL Server? And then I'm pet. Uh, specifying the password that is something so strong. If you like Crowded House, yay. Anyway, there I run that code, and all I'm asking for is the server name. I get that result, which also is the container ID. So a very uh, yeah. quick way to show you kind of that flow. What's up? We have a couple of questions mm -hmm. in chat here. Sure. Uh, first was, what happens when that version is no longer the latest? Is that tag somehow removed on your local image? You will have to pull latest again uh, to get the latest latest. And then when you get the latest latest, so let's say CU6 came out, which I think it did actually. Um, right now, CU5 on my laptop points to latest. If I pull latest latest again, I'm gonna get a new latest. And what I'll see is, Doc, this is a great question. Um, we'll see latest, uh, we'll see this latest we'll have like right now these two image ids are identical because they're the same right if i pull latest again this one will up this one eh, this one will update probably to a new image id for the latest latest which is maybe a cu6 right okay and the other question was is each container basically its own instance thinking yes. in sql terminology yeah, like literally, you're, you're like one like one nanosecond ahead of me. That's literally the next thing to show you. Uh, SQL Server and Linux architecture does not have the concept of named instances, but that's okay because here I could just start up another container listening on another port, which is all named instances really do. If you look at like under the hood on how a named instance works, it's just the named instance routes you to a particular SQL Server running on a particular port on that base OS. It's a good question. No, oh, looks like that was it. Cool. So let's do that. Let's. So we just, you know, just kind of the concept of SQL CMD talked to fourteen thirty three. Now let's start up another SQL Server. Again, I want to do this again because that bugs me. But don't change things during demos. That's how you break things. So this time, same uh, environment variables being set. New name, new port. Right, fourteen thirty four this time. On and it's still inside the container of fourteen thirty three. And we're going to detach the same container image. I can run CU5. I can run 2017. It doesn't have to be the same. Uh, but that's just how I wrote the code. Um, but it could be a different one. So if I do a Docker PS now, that's because I want to zoom in and get out for a nanosecond, then I'll zoom right back in. Uh, but from left to right, very similar. Two different container IDs, same image, same command. We can see the time is a little bit different about when they were created. 
1433 for SQL 1, 1434 for SQL 2. All right, so two independent instances of SQL Server up and running on my laptop right now. And also, they didn't, they didn't even point this out. Did you notice how fast that started up? So imagine being able to programmatically deploy SQL Server over and over and over again uh, in code, right? And these environment variables that are available, I think it's like, last time I checked, there's like 50 plus environment variables for configuration points for deploying SQL Server in code. And so that's a very powerful concept, right? You guys get it. I can take that, I can put it in source control. That's how I deploy SQL Servers and, you, and reuse that over and over and over again. So for me to access that SQL Server, same query, 1434 this time. So we're just gonna point it at that second instance that's up and running. Now I get that other container ID ending in 3E2, ending in 3E2, which is our SQL2 container, right? So one thing uh, that's kind of a common task for DBAs is to inject data. And so how do I get stuff into this container so that this container can work with it? And here we can see a command docker cp. I'm going to copy a backup file, which is in my current working directory. Like so literally my base OS. I'm going to copy that into the SQL2 container at this file system location, var opt mssql data, which is the default data location for SQL Server databases. Now that's totally configurable, but we're just using the default config right now. On my base OS here, I have a file that is just kind of the restore gymnastics to restore a database. And again, for me to run that command, I just point SQL CMD at 1434. I'm just running a SQL script it's gonna restore that database on our SQL2 instance on 1434. Fingers crossed, there we go, a restore database successful. And so now inside the container, I can see data, right? And so this way I can give this, I can take this container and give it to a developer and they can go about their business. Now, a powerful concept for troubleshooting really uh, is being able to go inside a container. And I can do that with uh, Docker exec. And that Docker exec with the parameter minus IT uh, gives me the ability to connect to a container. This time I'm using the name SQL1. I'm going to run the process of bin bash, which then when I run that process, gives me a shell inside the container. So my username in for the application running inside the container is MSSQL. And then this is the container ID is my host name. Now, we talked a little bit about the isolation of containers or app one app two app three and they don't know about each other because of this concept of process isolation inside of a container and here's a real good visualization of that inside this operating system right um, like on my base os i have dozens and dozens hundreds of processes running but inside the container i have four due to the architecture of sql server there's always two excuse me two sql server processes running here's my shell and then here is uh, the process listing that we just ran. These, this SQL Server process does not know anything about any other processes running on this OS or that other container that's up and running. That's gonna have its entirely own separate process address space that it's gonna work within, or process space. And uh, which is a fantastic thing because if you have conflicting libraries or anything that would cause you to before to have to install two virtual machines or two physical servers, that problem is gone, right? Because of the concepts of process isolation with containers. If I do a directory listing on var opt MSSQL data, there's the backup file that we just copied in, and there's the database files that we just restored. Those are inside the container, all right? Now, we talked about the writable layer uh, a second ago. That data is in the writable layer, so it's tightly coupled with the lifecycle of this container that we just started up. Now, if I stop that container, I still have my data, right? I just shut the container down. That writable layer is still part of the container itself. If I look at a process listing, I still have SQL 1, right? That's still up and running. And the definition of SQL 2 still exists. It's just shut down, right? You see exit at zero because I sent a signal to the process to terminate. Exit zero is good. That's a graceful termination of the container. Non-zero exit codes are bad. Just Google whatever the error code is. I could start that container back up, 
right? So just think about, okay, just restarting the SQL Server, and then I can get access to that data again. And Docker PS, both containers are up and running. We can see the life cycle is a little bit different in that it was created a couple minutes ago, but it's only been up for a couple seconds where, you know, we kind of started all at once. Those, those numbers are really close. So that's what those values mean there. So let's go ahead and stop. Yep. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, it's going to stop both containers then. One, two, down. What's up? Uh, a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, can you use the regular SQL Server Management Studio tools to manage the Docker SQL? Yes. I don't have a Windows machine mm -hmm. uh, readily available, but um, it's actually kind of cool. Uh, in SSMS, uh, in the upper left-hand corner, like the tree view of an instance, so rather than have the little server icon, they figured it out and they changed it to a little penguin. Adorbs. Um, but yeah, all that tool, all <laughs> all that tooling exists. The SQL agent exists. There are some rough edges around things like uh, SQL PowerShell uh, inside of agent jobs, like things like that. Like if you start getting like those dustier corners of things that run. Uh, but it's nearly feature, like 100%. Meh. It's very close to being feature, having feature parity between Windows and Linux. Um, Azure Data Studio is a thing, and that's kind of where you see a lot of people gravitating towards in the cross-platform world. Uh, but you can just treat it like any other SQL Server instance. And then the last one here, running SQL container with MS SQL account. What if I want to use a command with root access or sudo command? So the original SQL Server container that came out up until 17, forget exactly when they changed it in 19. Uh, the original container ran as root, and then the 19 container, I think, ran as root for a little bit, and then it switched it over to MSSQL. And there were some pain points around that conversion. Um, uh, SQL Server container root and systems and so that i covered that here in this blog post um where it talks about going from the old way and just dealing with permissions and what you have to do to get out from behind that and so i'll include this in the links to download but you can execute processes inside of the containers uh if you need to and one there's one command uh, let me show you one other command. You find your window. Avert your eyes. Don't look. Box. Shrink. Nope. That's deploying SQL Server containers. Demos. Um, one thing that I think this is probably where you're heading is for executing processes with escalated privileges inside of containers, even though the container itself is running as MSSQL. Um, so if I need to do some, if the container is running as MSSQL and I need to do something inside of the container with escalated privileges, you can do this, uh, Docker exec root, or you can, if you, you can, when you instantiate the container, say Docker run, you can inject the user ID to run it as, but then you're running the whole thing as root. That kind of circumvents the whole idea behind running the container as a non-privileged user. Uh, but if I need to just do a thing, if I see that, like in this case right here, I'm just I'm changing the ownership of a file inside the SQL2 container, that's a way that you can execute like a command inside the container with escalator privileges. Does that answer the question? Silence is golden. Seems, yeah, <laughs> seems like, seems good. <laughs> okay, um, cool. All right, so with the crescendo of this whole SQL Server thing, if I delete those containers now, that's when that writable layer goes away for that container, right? And it's a very concrete thing now like to think, I had data inside the container. We restored the database. It's in the writable layer. I deleted the container. The whole thing's gone. That's what people call a resume generating event, right? And so what we want to do is not have that. We want to kind of decouple those two things together. And so let's go ahead and go through that process. We still have all of these images on the on my operating system here, but we have no containers. Like if I do a PS minus A, I got nothing, right? So let's make a database. Uh, let's make a SQL Server container, but 
use those concepts that I talked about in the beginning. I'm decoupling the configuration, right? So yeah, it's right here, I'm injecting config, potentially, if I get my tabs and spaces right. And I'm also decoupling state, right? Remember the picture where I, in, the, in the presentation where I had volume one external to the container? That's what's happening right now. So all this other stuff is the same with the exception of this minus V. What we're saying is I'm gonna make a Docker data volume named SQL data one, and I'm gonna mount it inside the container var off MSSQL data. SQL server, when it starts up, it's gonna start writing data into that location, right? That's where it before would be written to the writable layer, but I'm gonna put this volume at that location inside the file system, and so anything that changes is gonna land inside of there completely independent of the container. And we'll, I'll show you where that is in a second. So let's go ahead and run that. I'll show you where it's physically stored in a second on the base OS. So the container's up and running right now. So the SQL Server started up. It parked all of the files that it needs in var up MSSQL data. I'm gonna copy a backup in there now, and I'm gonna restore that database. So there we see that was successful. Just to double check my math. I'm gonna ask SQL Server to give me all the names of all the databases. There is the one that we just restored. So now if I stop the container and delete the container again, whereas a minute ago, that had, was the writable layer is gone, right? The container still has a writable layer. It's just that we put a volume at a particular location inside of that container. So there's still the container image, the writable layer, and the data volume, which is where our application data is gonna be. If I do another Docker run now, the ones like this, no Satino guy, it's really crazy about these like new lines. Uh, if I do another one now, and I start the same exact code as a second ago, right, SQL one, I'm gonna use that same data volume again. And so SQL Server is gonna start up, it's gonna see in var off MSSQL data, it's got data because it was there already. Let's look, let's go ahead and ask SQL Server for all of its databases, and there is the database, right? Whereas a minute ago, we threw everything away when I deleted SQL 2. This time I made a new container with the data volume, restored the database, the data is in the data volume, deleted the container, threw it away, brought a new container down and started it up. This could be a new version of SQL Server. I could have CU6, I could have whatever I want to run there, and that would be a uh, way that I can kind of decouple the configuration and the state, right? The configuration here, the state is in here, and I know that it's always in there. Where is that data for real? That's in this data volume. Let's find out where it really is. So if you Docker volume inspect on the name of the data volume, that's where it really is. It's at this location, var lib docker volumes, SQL data one data on the base OS. Now, there's some black magic occurring, there's some voodoo, whatever expression you want to use on where that stuff is physically sitting on my operating system because of this thing called HyperKit. Uh, but let's set that aside for now and just know that it's on, this phys on my machine, on my base operating system. And if this was a Linux container, it would actually be, a Linux container running on a Linux OS it would actually be at that location. Cool. So let's go ahead and stop our container, which just shuts our app down remove our container, still our data still there. All we did is remove the container. When I do this, this is when that data goes away. So we're kind of managing those things as two separate entities. Cool. All right, so let's shift gears into PowerShell land. It's like a PowerShell thing, like all the SQL Server stuff. But it's, you know, it's an app that we're all familiar with. We kind of know like things like instances and questions about SSMS. So you guys know what that is. And so I think that's a real good way to bring containers into the Microsoft space, uh, regardless of if you're in the data community or not. So similar concepts as a second ago, where we have tags and versions and things like that kind of tightly coupled. And so I have, you know, PowerShell latest, PowerShell seven exactly on 1804 and preview, and I've already pulled all these images down. They're not as big as SQL Server containers, as we saw when I did, um, you can see the image up to date for all of them. If I do Docker images, you can see SQL Server is a gig and a half approximately, and the PowerShell containers 
305 megabytes, which honestly, in the container universe, that's pretty big. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping to see these things get a little bit smaller. I mean, moving 300 megs around in an enterprise data center, not that big of a deal, but it can add some latency to application startup uh, when we're working with apps. Can we inject a question? Yes. What's up? Uh, says, as I keep thinking about this, is the container kind of firewalled by default, as in not listening to other ports? <laughs> so it depends on the app. And so let's look at this app here. So um, before we did, um, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, we did a Docker inspect, <coughs> excuse me, on the SQL Server container. And in this container config section, there was a section called exposed ports on 1433. This PowerShell container, like pretty sure, let's still make sure I'm saying the right thing. Yeah, doesn't have that section or doesn't have that in the section. So this isn't listening on something. So it's not that it's um, firewalled. It depends on your application. Now, in the SQL Server demos where I did this, my base OS still has to expose that port. So if I have the operating system filtering on and blocking 1433 for incoming traffic, that's the people like that's how we would control that at the network level. This thing could be up all day on the local host and I could still pass traffic to it if I needed to. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, we do Docker inspect. So yeah, we'll go ahead with that then. So let's run a PowerShell container. Now we're going to do this slightly different than what we did before in the SQL server container. And generally speaking, you don't do interactive work with containers. You start them up, you inject some stuff and they do the things for you. Uh, but I kind of want to nail home some of the concepts right now. So Docker run. I'm going to give it a name. It's going to be PowerShell latest. Before I used minus D, right? Detach, or you can say minus minus detach. And that starts the container up and then gives me the console back, right? It detaches the process from the running shell and it goes about its business. We're doing the opposite here. I'm saying interactive and I want you to attach a terminal or TTY. And I want you to run PowerShell latest. And boom, I'm running PowerShell 703 inside of the container on this OS, right? This is a Mac, and my, my Mac certainly has PowerShell installed. Let's see what BWSH, this is on um, 702 on my base OS. I know that's really, really small. Sorry about that. Um, but my base OS has 702, and I can run whatever version of PowerShell I want inside of a container on this operating system. And so let's go ahead and do some typical PowerShell commands where we're getting started with PowerShell. If I do a PS version table, you can see I'm running 703 on core. It's going to run, it's running on Linux. And that is what is inside of that container. If I do a get process now, whereas before you saw two SQL servers, a bash and uh, the PS command, those were all isolated inside of that one container. Here you can see just PWSH. It's just the fact that I have a shell up and running. It's the only process running inside the container and the process ID is one. Now I have the full suite of commands available to me that come inside of PowerShell core. Now, if I needed to install a module, I would install a module now, right? So I need to get, be able to work with that uh, inside of a container. Now, um, I just had an idea for a future PowerShell summit talk. Uh, the concepts behind building container images and things like that, like if I needed to have a collection of modules, I could either automate their installation off this base container, or I could pull the PowerShell image, install the modules in that new container, and then make a new container image from that, and then share that with my developers or whomever I needed to share that with. So inside this container, let's just put some data down. Let's just say, you know what, I'm going to write some data into a file. And I'm going to show you guys where that file is. You can see it's on my base OS. It's apparently tomorrow, right? For the folks in UTC, so not quite New Zealand time. Uh, and now once we get out of the container, something different happens now. Whereas before, 
when we went in the container and got out of the container, the container stayed up and running until I said, Docker, stop, right? When we got out of that container, this time, our shell exited, right? The container's not running anymore. Uh, think about, so before we minus D, it detached. It was up and running as a service, effectively a service in the background, as a background process. I started this PowerShell container interactively. I exited out my shell, my PowerShell process is like, I'm done and shuts down. And that's what happened here. So we don't have a running container anymore. But I do have is the definition of that container still available to me. So from left to right here, we have the container ID, the thing that we're running, the command, the image that we're running, the command that was started, when it was created, and the fact that it exited just a few seconds ago. And to that network question, there's nothing for ports. Like there's no application listening. Cool. Let's see. So Docker PS, but that container is still there. Like the stuff that I did inside that container is still available. So I can get back into that container with Docker start again, specifying that container name, which is uh, PWSH latest. And I'm using a short uh, rather than minus minus interactive. I'm just using minus I this time. Boom, I'm back inside the container and my data is still there. What's up, PowerShell group, Mississippi PowerShell group, right? And so just, that's kind of the life cycle of a PowerShell container. It's slightly different than what we saw with the SQL Server container. Now, if that PowerShell process kind of is one of those, like we could, I mean, if we ran like a hard loop or something inside of there, then it wouldn't exit. So. All right, so let's go ahead and remove that container. That file was in the writable layer of the container, right? So that's gone. Like they, there's no longer what's up, Mississippi PowerShell user group. That file it was part of the writable layer of that container, and we just destroyed that when we removed the container. So now we kind of want to build up like a couple other ways that we can interact with PowerShell. Now, one of the things that you can do is I can override the process that is started inside of the container. Uh, we, that actually happened in the SQL Server container, but I glossed over it. Uh, but here, rather than running the process that is defined when the PowerShell container start, PowerShell, excuse me, when the container starts up, which is just PWSH, I can inject a new process. And so let's walk through the syntax here, Docker run, the container, the new process. And so rather than just running PowerShell, I'm injecting, I want you to run this command too, right? And so if I do that, the container is gonna start up, it's gonna run that command and the container is gonna exit, right? I could do that for any version that I want, right? So here I'm specifying 700 Ubuntu 18.04, whereas in the previous one, I was specifying uh, just the latest. And you can see it's pretty fast, right? Container starts up, runs the process, shuts down. If I wanna run a preview container, again, like this gives me the ability to very easily run any version of PowerShell that I want, because this was 703, 700, uh, was it 703? Yeah, I think it was 703. And then 70, I think it's 703 update, or preview update five. Let's run this code here. Or 71, excuse me, preview, preview five. And so I can just, choose whichever one I want to work with to do this work, right? And this could be a reference to a file. I could pull down something with invoke web request. I can do lots and lots of different things to inject commands when I'm running inside of PowerShell containers. Now, all of those containers are actually around. Every time I ran a pro one of those processes, it created a container for me and they just did their work and then they shut down. And But I still have the container to work with. Uh, if I need to. Now, here's some command line syntax <clears throat> to delete all those containers in one fell swoop, right? So be careful with this one. Uh, but you can do this. So you could say Docker PS uh, for all running containers. I'm going to grep off a list. I'm going to print the container ID and pipe that into a command called XARG. And that's going to delete all those containers very quickly for me. Now let's look at this from another angle. Let's say we have a collection of scripts that we want to work with. And uh, we could do this a couple of different ways. I'm going to use a data volume again, but I can actually attach 
to a local operating system volume two. So rather than being like kind of that isolated Docker managed resource, I can actually attach it to a file system location on my base OS. So I can have a collection of scripts right here, or I can store those scripts inside of volume, which is the demo that I'm gonna do now. And so I'm gonna run this container just to create it. And it's gonna, I'm gonna create the container with a data volume named PowerShell scripts. And I'm gonna mount that inside the container at slash scripts. And so right now all I have is a stopped container with a volume at that location. So here we can see our stopped container exited a second ago. Now I can copy a script or a collection of scripts if I want to into that container. So Docker CP, just whatever PowerShell script I got here, and I'm gonna copy it into the container name, which matches the name on line 67 there when we created the container. And I'm gonna copy it into slash scripts, gonna copy into that destination directory inside that container that we just created. Now I'm gonna just for fun, go hey, delete that container, gone, right? But I have, I still have that data volume with that script in there. Now I can create a new container. This time I'm gonna create that container and attach it to my terminal so that I get a shell. So that I can show you this, right? I have a collection of scripts independent of the life cycle of the container, and I can share this amongst multiple containers if I need to. Run on that script, there we go. We can see the, the PowerShell script just writes some stuff to output. Again, that could be a module, right? Inside of that scripts directory, or maybe I'll call it modules, but you get the point. I can inject various stuff into the container using this technique. And this is using a Docker data volume, but again, this could be a path on the base OS, so I don't have to do that copy step if I didn't need to. But one of the reasons I like doing it this way is I can take this container in it that's up and running, and I can package that into a new image and share that with somebody else. Okay, so let's get out of that container and remove that container. What do we got here? Oh yeah, function as a service, right? Fast, I don't know if that, that's really a thing. Um, so very similar to the instantiation that we just ran a second ago, uh, but I'm kind of bringing all the techniques together. And so let's walk through this command here, docker run rm. What that's gonna do is when that container starts up and finishes processing, it's gonna shut down and delete the container. Uh, I'm gonna attach that volume that we just created together, and I'm gonna run this container image, right? This is gonna be not interactive, and so it's not gonna give me a shell. It's gonna run a PowerShell process, and it's gonna call a file that's inside the container, right? And so if I run this now, the thing is gonna start up, it's gonna run the script, it's gonna shut down, it's gonna delete the container, right? And you basically just built a serverless platform. And we did that in like four lines of code. If I do a Docker PS, I don't even have a name on this container, right? And so it's gonna, it would have created a name for it uh, if we didn't delete it with the minus RM parameter, it's gone. But we still ran that code and did that thing, which kind of has some interesting ramifications from an auditing standpoint, think about it. So let's get and run that code again to delete any containers that we have. And then those scripts are inside that data volume until I do this, until I delete that PS scripts, a Docker data volume. So that is that for the demo side of the house, let's jump back over to some more concepts and we'll wrap it up. I think we're pretty, just a little bit over on time. Um, so container orchestration, right? So we don't want to be running around our data center typing Docker run, Docker run, Docker run, Docker run. That's not a way to do stuff. And moreover, uh, we want to kind of shift away from doing things imperatively and start doing declarative operations, like writing code and checking that code in the source code and using those things over and over and over again in repeatable testable process, testing, tested processes. Uh, and so container orchestrators help us deploy containers in an enterprise way. And when we talk about starting up containers and a collection of resources, when I talked about, you know, I could have to kind of stamp out that topology over and over and over in my data center. Well, that's what a container orchestrator does. It figures out, given a collection of resources in a data center, where can I run these apps, right? Where can I start this PowerShell container up? 
where can I start the SQL Server container up? And it does things like that. It also manages state. If I say, run the SQL Server container and run it all the time, if it crashes, well, it's gonna start up a new SQL Server container. And so that's a very powerful concept uh, of managing state over time inside application deployments. Container orchestrators provide load balancing services, so it kind of abstracted it away from those traditional network infrastructures uh, that we would have to work with to get those kind of services. Don't get me wrong, there's still a valuable place for enterprise class load balancing, but container orchestrators also provide load balancing services. Uh, container orchestrators also provide a networking abstraction in that uh, especially if you're building microservices applications and you're consuming lots of IPs and ports and things like that, you probably want to abstract that away from your core infrastructure so that you're not burning up large amounts of IPs and causing your network engineers lots of pain. Uh, container orchestrators also provide access to pers uh, persistent storage. So if I need to persist data independent of the lifecycle of the containers that are being orchestrated, we have those capabilities. And declarative models, which I kind of touched on a second ago, is writing code to deploy our apps. And job distribution is a big one. If I need to do stuff uh, in a scheduled way, run this PowerShell job every two hours, run that PowerShell job every 10 minutes, I can write code that tells SQL Server, that tells my container orchestrator to do that kind of work for me. They also provide the ability, container orchestrators also provide secrets and certificate management, which is a powerful concept we're still working in things like cloud, and also with um, decoupling configuration and state. Where can I store my configuration and these sensitive secrets and certificates? So in the container orchestrator universe, there's a couple players, uh, Docker Swarm, right? And Docker Enterprise, uh, kind of still around, but this is the one that won the container war, Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a container orchestrator that provides all of the services that we just discussed. Now, Kubernetes is an open source platform, right? And so some orgs kind of shy away from running purely open source softwares because they don't get support contracts and they can't call 1-800-somebody when things go wrong. That's where Red Hat OpenShift came in. So Red Hat OpenShift is Kubernetes, but underneath the Red Hat umbrella. It's got some additional layers on top of it to provide some other types of orchestra, or, yeah, additional layers for orchestration. Uh, but under the hood, it is Kubernetes. Now in the cloud, you have things like AKS and GKE uh, and also EKS and Amazon. So those are managed uh, platform as a service services where you can just consume Kubernetes in the cloud. Uh, Azure Arc is extending AKS into uh, on-premises data centers. So keep an eye out for that as an easy way to get Kubernetes in your, in your enterprise data center and leveraging Azure Arc. So let's kind of go through what we talked about. So hopefully we understand what a container is and kind of the value that it can provide in being able to just deploy applications and run code very quickly in a way that's isolated and also in a neat way where I've kind of decoupled the configuration in the state and able to use various versions of applications completely independent of each other on the base OS. Uh, We've talked a lot about running SQL Server and also running PowerShell, right? So two big core things in the Microsoft space have been containerized and are easily consumable by us as the consumers or IT professionals. We looked at the container universe, like kind of who the players were. You know, we looked at a little bit at Kubernetes and Red Hat OpenShift. We also looked at, you know, Docker and Rocket and all those different players in that game and lots and lots of demos. So I'm gonna give the code, uh, I'm gonna send a link to David and I'm also gonna put it on my GitHub probably first thing in the morning. It's getting a little late uh, where I'm at. And if you're gonna do this in an enterprise class way, you're gonna use a container orchestrator. But of course, get started with the stuff that we use today. Now, uh, I guess here's my contact information. So there's my email. Uh, please, if you need have any questions, feel free to hit me up either via email or on Twitter. Um, I have a bunch of blog posts uh, about these kind of key things and I'll, uh, add the blog post that I reference on how to run uh, code as escalated privileges uh, in the links. And I also have some training around these ideas. If you're new to Linux and have never seen it before, I have a course for that and six more uh, for more advanced topics. And I also have six courses on uh, Kubernetes and how to get started there. If you want free access to that stuff, this is not a sales pitch. 
hit me up and I'll give you free access to that content uh, with a 30 day trial code. I have some links in the decks for everyone. Um, if you need to get started with Docker on Windows or Docker on Linux, um, those are the two ways that you can get started there. And some really, really, really well formed, put together documents uh, from Docker themselves on how to get started and some of the interesting security concepts when running applications inside of containers. So I'm gonna open it up and see if there are any questions. Anthony, uh, what skills would you say are required and or helpful to create and manage containers? So like if someone wants to get started in this, what do, what do they need to know? So I think what I would probably start doing first is getting this code, right? And kind of getting started with how these things live, right? The life cycle is a big thing. That's a big adjustment for people, kind of that ephemerality of containers. Um, not gonna lie, like I, I'm making an assumption, but this is a PowerShell user group. You're probably coming primarily from a Windows universe. I came from kind of a cross platform and lived in both worlds for a long time. I, for me, I, I my opinion is start learning Linux, uh, just kind of the core concepts if you're not familiar with it already. Um, containers, I, I truly think are gonna be the way that even in the Windows, you know, in the, in the Microsoft world, how we're going to be deploying applications and getting started there. Now, I'm coming at this completely from an ops standpoint, like I'm not a developer and there's a whole another slew of tech and techniques for deploying and building and managing and deploying applications instead of containers, like the stuff that we were doing today. Uh, where is that? we were just focusing on these elements right this from the registry down when the next if you're kind of in that development space or even in like that devops -y space it's this whole thing right this whole pipeline is another area of, of expertise that i think there's a lot of opportunity for especially operations people that know a little bit about dev and know a lot about ops and you can bridge this gap and this stuff that we saw today completely automated and things like Azure DevOps and uh, there's another was that other big automation thing, but effectively being able to run this process in a completely automated way without people, which is crazy if you think about it, but that's where how people are able to roll out code very, very quickly into their, into their applications, into their systems. So that's another element um, is like, a, place that I would invest for like to think about how I'd invest my time. So. Hello. Just crickets. <laughs> it's all good. I have more questions. I just didn't want to hog. No, it's all good. Let's see. I'm looking at the comments and vote command parallel. If I could ever get parallel execution in PowerShell to um, be happy with me, <laughs> I would love that. Oh, um, I can help you with that. <laughs> I've, I've, I've gotten some skill at it. It's, um, yeah, one time as a customer of mine, they had, um, they had 1,400 instruments distributed across the U.S. and they were all connected over um uh vpns and they didn't have an automated way to test it hey can i touch everything and well i didn't want to run 1400 pings sequentially that would take forever uh and so that was my first soiree into um parallel power shelling because i was using think test connection or test net connection to answer that question for me now my other question is and this is the where my mind starts to break down on the containers part is the the port mapping and load balancing of an application and the I'm, I really appreciated your talking about the persistent volumes because that's that's where I tend to struggle the most is how do you how do you stand up multiple applications that are all 
basically putting forward a single application. So it's it's using containers. So if something goes wrong with one of them, you just stand it back up, but the the uh, load balancing layer figures out where to send the traffic. Yeah, I, I don't I don't I don't do it in this presentation. Um, this the PowerShell version of this presentation. But let's look at another presentation that I have. This is why I love user groups because I can just like do this kind of stuff. So let's look at this from another angle. Um, the load balancing is going to become a facility of the container orchestrator, right? And so uh, let's say, I know that's inverted. How do I swap, swap this place? Um, and so let's say in a cluster, I have a collection of machines. Hopefully this answers your question. You know, this could be one machine, could be 10 machines, and I've deployed applications, right? And this is, again, my classic enterprise architecture of app one, two, and three. Uh, in the container orchestrator provides an abstraction called a service, right? And the cool thing about containers, and I alluded to this and having a network and abstraction, is we get, and we don't really have to worry so much about where an application is on the network. The container orchestrator is gonna track that for me. So each one of these apps will have an IP address and will be listening on a port. Do I care which one that is? No, because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna provide this service abstraction, which is gonna give me a persistent IP on the network and a persistent port on the network. That service is gonna keep track of where the applications are running in the cluster. So application one and application two, we're seeing application one, regardless of where it's running. So on this server over here or on this server over here, will be registered as endpoints in the load balancer for that service. So I'll point users at the IP or the, even the DNS name for that service. And that service will then distribute that workload automatically for me under the hood and distribute that to wherever that application lives. Now, if this happens, right, that application crashes, I can tell my service to automatically do this. I don't have to write code to do it. It automatically happens to deregister that missing pod or that missing container from the service and stop load balancing to it. Now, I can also tell that service if the container comes back to re-register it for me automatically and start distributing workload to that for me. So the persistency comes from the definition of this thing called a service, which is kind of just a logical load balancer inside of a cluster, inside of, in this case, is a Kubernetes constructs. Um, and so that workload is distributed to the apps by this thing. So I'm never really pointing users directly at those apps. Um, I could, but if that thing dies and starts up somewhere else, then I got a problem, right? The service kind of maintains that, that uh, whole thing for me. Now, let's extend that to SQL Server, right? Kind of bring home that point. Um, now, in SQL Server, I have to solve the storage problem still. We talked about persistent volumes. And container orchestrators provide the ability to have persistent volume shared amongst multiple nodes or being able to move between multiple nodes, right? Kind of like shared storage clusters and things like that that we're used to in the Windows space. Uh, so if I say, hey, Kubernetes or whatever container orchestrator it is, run one SQL Server all the time. Now, there's a concept here, like I don't tell, I don't tell the container orchestrator to run 10 SQL Servers because those would be 10 identical copies of that application. That kind of breaks down from a logical standpoint. I would have, I could have 10 different deployments of SQL Server, each depend, connecting to their own disks. But the previous example, I had two of the same exact app that I could load balance to arbitrarily. So think of like web apps in that space, persistent state applications in this space where we'd have one. Now I store that data somewhere on that storage network I expose that into the container and I use the same concept as a service, but now I'm load balancing to just one SQL server. So you're like, why would I load balance to one SQL server? Because of this, if that SQL server dies, right, the container orchestrator will do this. It's like, hey, you told me to keep one SQL server online all the time. Remember that managing state concept? We talked about what a container orchestrator is. Well, you told me to keep this one SQL server online all the time. Well, I'm gonna do that. 
and maybe I need to move it to another node because that node died, or maybe the resources are out of whack and the application crashed or whatever. And what it'll do is it'll start that container up, it'll catch the storage, it'll update the service and load balance to this new container, right? That's a new container. Every single time SQL Server stops and starts. And that's where those configuration and states concepts come into play where I really want to decouple those because now I can build a system that says, you know what, that thing died. It's no big deal for me to just take that container and throw it away and start up a new one because I know my state is in this volume. I know my configuration. I can pull from some place that stores my config and inject that into the container and get back to where I was. And it can do that automatically. And it's a very powerful concept in container orchestration. Question on that, though, is will it automatically replay the log files and bring the database back into consistency? So that's a, that's a function completely of SQL Server, right? So if that file, or excuse me, there's, that's a function of SQL Server. So if I get in a state where um, this happens, right, and then the SQL Server starts up, if that was a non-graceful termination, of the pod of the container like they would just effectively pull the plug on the server think about it that way well what would happen in a regular server right when you plug it back in sql server is going to go hmm i gotta do uh all the things i would have to do to recover the database in a graceful way so i'm going to undo any non-committed transactions i'm going to redo any transactions that are in the transaction logs that have to be redone that stuff those semantics still completely apply inside a container now i would need access to the data like i need the log file to be able to make those decisions it's like a, it's like a presentation and a half now <laughs> no, this has been really good i think i've gained a deeper understanding of containers like a better understanding of containers in the last hour than i have in the last year of trying to figure it out on my own oh that's cool yeah it's always good to hear that if um we hopefully get people kind of bootstrapped because there's there's a big hump once you kind of get over that hump then it's like it's smooth sailing after that you kind of get those concepts of ephemerality and injecting configuration like it really kind of opens things up so well cool i'm going to throw my contact info on the screen one last time so everybody has it I'll use a different slide this time. Um, but if you have any questions, you know, take a screenshot. This is going to be recorded. Uh, and you can kind of hit me up um, either on Twitter or via email. And I appreciate you guys having me. Well, thank you for presenting that for us. That's been a really, really good presentation. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you for the positive feedback. <laughs>